Number 11, how to read the Gospels. Last time we looked at background for the New Testament. Today we dip our toes into the first part of the New Testament. The New Testament has 27 books in it, and the Gospels make up the first four of the New Testament. They are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Gospels are biographies of Jesus. They tell the life of Christ. But they're more than just biographies. And, and that comes through in their name. We call them Gospels because that means good news. So there's an evangelistic component to the Gospels. They're not seeking to dispassionately and in an unbiased manner describe an important person. They're trying to get you to believe in him. And they are not hiding that fact. <laughs> Usually it's like the first sentence. <laughs> but um, the Gospels are the, contain the story of Christ, and they're the good news that the Messiah has come, and His name is Jesus. And there's a, there's a push that you would follow Him as well in the Gospels. It's subtle, but it's there. So let's talk about reading the Gospels. Just like I said with the Psalms, it's probably best not to just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Boom, 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 boom. Like I said, don't read Psalm 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, all the way. Like, don't read 10 Psalms in one setting. You'll have no idea what the first seven were by the time you finish. Um, unless you're doing a concentrated study on the life of Christ or some sort of complicated study on the Gospels, it's probably better to, to read one Gospel and then read some other part of the Bible and then read another Gospel, read some other part of the Bible like that. And I think that'll come a little bit more into focus as we end up. So, you know, read Matthew, then Deuteronomy. Read Mark, and then read Isaiah. Read Luke and Acts, one after the other, because they're written by the same person. Uh, read John, and then read Romans. Um, so that's kind of the idea. What are the Gospels? Well, each has its own focus. Each has its own focus. All are evangelistic. And each tries to convince you to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They follow a basic storyline. So I have 13 ingredients of the story here. Not every gospel covers every one of these points. For example, number one, the birth narratives, the birth of Christ, is only described in Matthew and Luke, not in Mark and John. All right, so I'm kind of mixing things together here. But this is the general outline that you'll find of the gospels. So Jesus is born in the beginning. And then we switch to John the Baptist and his ministry. After that, Jesus comes to John and associates with John and gets baptized by John. And then, after that, Jesus calls the twelve and initiates his ministry, which includes teachings and miracles. There's a lot of conflict with his critics that Jesus has in all four Gospels. Then, the last week of his life is really the focal point of the Gospels. So that always begins in all the Gospels with the same event, what they call the triumphal entry. When Jesus rides the donkey into Jerusalem, that's sort of the beginning of the end. After that, there's intensified conflict for several days where Jesus is fielding stumper questions and <laughs> provoking the authorities by cleansing the temple, things like that. Then we have the Last Supper, the arrest, trial, and execution, Resurrection appearances and the Great Commission. So this is the, the general flow of the Gospels, any one of the Gospels, more or less. Some will not have all these ingredients, but this is a general outline. And as far as our four canonical Gospels go, they're in the order of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but I'd like to cover them for you in this class in order of length. So I want to cover Mark, John, Matthew, then Luke, because... Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, and I want to begin with Mark. Now, Mark has about 11,000 Greek words in it. I love Mark. I love all the Gospels. Just full, full disclosure, I'm not going to like pick a favorite. But Mark is great because uh, it's so, he's so raw and unfiltered. It's action-packed. He uses this word immediately. What is it? 42 times. Immediately, immediately, immediately. Okay, all right, I got it. 
doesn't have much of the teachings of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. The focus is on the deeds of Jesus, not on his teachings. There's a few teachings here and there. It's not like Jesus never talks in the Gospel of Mark. But Mark is really short compared to the other Gospels. And what, it, what doesn't Mark have? Well, a lot of the sayings of Christ. Also, Mark has Aramaisms. Aramaisms are Aramaic phrases that are transliterated into Greek. And scholars puzzle over, well, why in the world would he do that? My take on it, and this is a fairly common take, is that these are moments where Mark wanted to, to be sure that the reader could, could say and the hearer could hear the exact word Jesus said. So, one of them is Talitha Kum, which Jesus says to a little dead girl, and it means little girl, arise. Those are the actual words that he said. And so, in the Greek text, you come across these non-Greek words, and you're like, what's this? Well, if you also know Aramaic, you'd be like, oh, that's, that's just an Aramaic phrase written out with Greek letters. Of course, in our English translation, it's all done into English, but you get, you get the idea. It's, Talitha Kum is not an English word where you come from, right? Okay. Then the other one uh, in Mark 7.34 is Ephatha. Ephatha. Eph Fa, fa. There's like two F sounds in there. And that means be opened. He said that to the, the deaf and mute man. So, and then the most famous, Eloi, Eloi, Lema, Sabachthani, on the cross, the actual words of Jesus. Whereas in Matthew, they're in Hebrew. In Mark, they're in Aramaic. And uh, so, there you have it. Mark was probably John Mark who is mentioned in the book of Acts and other places of the Bible, he was not one of Jesus' followers until later, until after Jesus had done his ministry. He went on to go on the first missionary trip with Paul and Barnabas, but then ditched them halfway through. And then when the second trip was coming around, Barnabas said, I want, you to, I want to bring John Mark with us again. And Paul said, I don't think so. And they had a big disagreement over it. So John Mark ended up going with Barnabas one way, and Paul grabbed Silas and went another way. So he's kind of a controversial person in that regard, I guess. But the picture we get of him later on is that he was restored, you know, as far as his relationship with Paul goes. And even later than that, he's associated with Peter in Rome. And we read this from Papias, who, writing, uh, who wrote a book called Exposition of the Sayings of the Lord in about the year 130, probably before 130. He died in 130. So you probably didn't write it like the day he died. You probably wrote it before he died. So early 100s, uh, not very long after the time of Christ. And Papias says this, And the elder used to say this, Mark, having become Peter's interpreter, wrote down accurately everything he remembered, though not in order of the things either said or done by Christ, for he neither heard the Lord nor followed him, but, him, but afterward, as I said, followed Peter, who adapted his teachings as needed, but had no intention of giving an ordered account of the Lord's sayings. Consequently, Mark did nothing wrong in writing down some of the things he remembered as he remembered them, for he made it his one concern not to omit anything that he heard or to make any false statement in them. So did you catch that? Mark, according to this source, followed Peter and adapted Peter's teachings. So, of course, Peter, Peter was one of the original 12 apostles. And if you read the Gospel of Mark, or really Matthew or Luke, you'll see that Peter is always in the center of the action. Well, maybe not always, but usually he's in the center of the action. Peter by himself, or Peter, James, and John, those three. And uh, that's Probably no coincidence. Now, um, just because I believe, going along with Papias here, that uh, Mark got his information from Peter, the Apostle Peter, I also believe that God assisted Mark in writing down what he was writing so that God's inspiration through the Spirit enabled him to write what needed to be written. Going on to our next one, we have John. 
about 15,000 words, 15,633 Greek words in the Gospel of John. Typically thought to be written last, but as it is with any of the Gospels, it's all speculation. Nobody, they don't have like dates on them. There's no way to really know <coughs> for sure when this Gospel or that Gospel was written. Uh, but typically, John is thought of as being written last. It's probably written by the Apostle John because his vocabulary and style is very similar to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. The Gospel of John is very different than Mark. Mark is rough around the edges. His grammar is not perfect, okay? He's, he's getting that message out. It's more like shoot from the hip. <laughs> Whereas like John, John, his, well, his Greek is very simple, like elementary school level Greek. Best Greek in the whole New Testament to start with, okay? But <clears throat> although his language is simple, his thoughts and what he's saying is abstract, metaphorical, and theological. It's complicated. He's a complicated person. He's, he, he would be the kind of person that you would have a long conversation with, and, and then you would think about it later on and say, what does that really mean? Uh, I think that's the, the Gospel of John. Whereas Mark, you, you're not going to misunderstand him because he's, say, he's saying like over and over, immediately, immediately, immediately. Then he healed this one. Then he healed that one. You know? John's more like, well, the, the, uh, the words that I speak to you are spirit and truth. What? Unless you're born again. What do you mean born again? What does that mean? Right? And to this day, like as Christians, we are still like trying to figure out the Gospel of John in some areas, right? Um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about himself a lot as opposed to the other Gospels. And there are also extensive, extensive teachings for his disciples, especially in the upper room discourse, which um, I think all in you could say is like 13 to 17 of John. Pretty sizable section. Starts with the Last Supper, then is four, chapters 14, 15, and 16, and then you have the high priestly prayer in chapter 17. John presents seven miracles that he calls signs. Whereas the other Gospels, Jesus has miracles all over the place. In John, they're very careful, carefully laid out. These are signs. And then we get this purpose statement from John, which is fant fantastic, right? He says in John 20, verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs. So it recognizes there's other miracles. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written. John, why did you pick those? These are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that, though, that through believing you may have life in his name. I love it. Purpose statement. He wants you to believe or continue to believe. There's a debate in the translation uh, or in the manuscripts about this. Some of the manuscripts read that you would believe as if you hadn't believed before, and now you're reading this, and now you're starting to believe. And other manuscripts read that you already believe and you're going to continue to believe. Whichever way it goes, the goal is clear in the Gospel of John. It's to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that through believing you may have life in his name. All right, on to Matthew. Matthew has about 18,000 words, and he was a tax collector known in Mark and Luke as Levi. So that's a little confusing. We have this Gospel of Matthew where he's called Matthew, and then in Mark and Luke he's called Levi. But this is just par for the course. It seems like everybody in the Bible has multiple names. What is the deal with that? I don't know. So Peter is also called Simon. And Cephas. So you have multiple names for these, for these people. Mark is called John Mark, right? So uh, that's just the way it is sometimes, I guess. So Matthew is also called Levi. He's one of the original 12. Mark is not one of the original 12. John is one of the original 12. And Matthew is one of the original 12. And then Luke is also not. So we have two that were original disciples and two that depended on eyewitnesses of one type or another. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew has a great deal of the teachings of Jesus. Jesus is the rabbi in Matthew. He's a teacher. And Matthew arranges his teachings into five blocks. Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. 
Chapter 10 is missionary instruction. Chapter 13 is parables of the kingdom. Chapter 18 is discourse on the church. And chapters 24 to 25 is the Olivet Discourse. Why do you think Matthew broke Jesus' Jesus's teachings into five blocks? Think Jesus only taught five times? Probably taught 27 times, right? I don't know. However many times he taught. Why, 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 why arrange it just into five? Well, the Torah has five books. And Matthew is especially interested in showing to a Jewish audience that Jesus is the Messiah. And so to a Jewish audience who is used to the five books of the Torah, the book of Psalms is broken into five sections. He breaks Matthew into these five blocks of teachings to show that Jesus is a new Moses, or Jesus is a fulfillment of the Torah, something, something along those lines. Uh, that's probably what is going on here. He, he likes this word fulfilled. You don't see it so much in the other Gospels, but Matthew, there, there, he'll quote from the Old Testament and he'll say, thus Jesus fulfilled what was said by so-and-so. And when it says fulfilled, it doesn't mean that there, there's a definite predictive prophecy in the Old Testament that only could possibly refer to Jesus. That's not what Matthew means by fulfilled. It means more like, then Jesus did something similar to somebody else. You know, it's more of like uh, going in the same direction as something rather than an arrow pointing just at this one bullseye. So, for example, Isaiah 7.14 talks about the virgin that will be, you know, born, or the, the child that would be born of a young woman or a virgin, depending on the translation. That child was born in Isaiah's time. That was a prophecy Isaiah gave to the king. He said to the king, a child will be born, a son will be given, you know, and you know, this, this is all going to happen. So, but then Matthew's like, no, 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 no. Jesus fulfilled that. So it's a both and. It's not Matthew saying, this is the only way to think about it. It's, this is just like that. Why do you think um, Matthew groups all of, well, not all, most of Jesus' miracles into just chapters 8 and 9? Would you do that? I think I would sprinkle them throughout, right? If I had all this material to work with, I think I'd put some here, put some there. You read, you read it through the Gospel of Matthew, and you have the, the birth narratives, and then you have the John the Baptist section. Jesus is uh, baptized, tempted, boom, right into a teaching for three chapters, and then it's just miracle time. And he did, I won't say every miracle, but almost every miracle of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew happens in chapter 8 and chapter 9 because he's not focused on chronology. Matthew is organizing his gospel based on topic and for other concerns other than this happened, then that happened, then that happened. We, in our culture, love chronological ordering. We love timelines. Our history books don't go out of order. But if you look at the Bible, look at the prophets, look at the prophet Jeremiah or Isaiah, there are, the prophecies are not necessarily in order. This one is next to this one because it's, it's about a similar topic rather than it happened this than that. So I think that's what's going on in the Gospel of Matthew. And, you know, we're coming onto their turf. This is how God inspired these people to write these things. So, you know, I don't think it's appropriate for us to be like, well, Matthew really needs to take a, you know, a course in history or something like that. I think we're, we're the ones that need to take the course in reading their kind of literature and, um, you know, understanding their reasons for it. Which brings us then to Luke. Luke's focus is on explaining Christianity to noble-born Romans, wealthy, significant people. Whereas Matthew is focused on the Jews, Luke is focused on the Romans and the Greeks and the, the, the noble class. How do I know that? Why would I say that? Well, Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, you catch that? Many. Many have undertaken to compile their narratives. There were lots of other Gospels too. Did you know that? There are other Gospels outside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, Luke it starts by saying, yeah, there's lots of Gospels. What's going to be different about yours, Luke? Verse 2, just as they were handed on to us, 
by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, as one having a grasp of everything from the start, to write a well-ordered account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have a firm grasp of the words in which you have been instructed. So from this, we gather that Theophilus was an important person. Why do I say that? Because he has this prefix on his name, most excellent. It's, it's not just a complimentary way of talking about somebody. It's also how other important Roman officials are addressed in the book of Acts. Like, uh, I think it's Felix or Festus, one of those two, is addressed as most excellent when Paul is speaking to him. And it's not just a nice way of saying things. It's, it's, it's an official way of addressing uh, a superior in that world. So what is Luke doing? He is writing this for Theophilus. Theophilus is a Christian. He has been instructed, but he's trying to give him better instruction, more instruction, give him the full account. And boy, does Luke ever. My goodness. Luke is longer than all the other ones. And then he writes a volume two, the whole book of Acts. So Luke is, a, is an overachiever, and his focus is to be well-ordered, to be chronolo- more chronologically minded than Mark or Matthew. It's certainly not John. John is, John's in theology land. Uh, you know, like his, his thoughts are, are high above ours. You know, <laughs> like, you don't try to bring them down to, to such simple matters as, you know, what happened before what. I'm not saying there's no chronology. They all start with John the Baptist, they all end with Jesus resurrected in the commissioning, right? So there is some chronology in all of them. But Luke especially focuses on this. And it says that he got information from eyewitnesses. Like I mentioned to you, Luke Luke is associated with Paul, traveled with Paul, but we don't have any reason to think Luke was a Christian at the time of Jesus. Luke is somebody that comes on the scene later. And Luke is a first-class historian. Look at this. Look at chapter 3 of Luke, verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. That is how you date something in the ancient world. What you do is you start with the biggest, most important person in the world, Tiberius Caesar. And you say, all right, 15th year of his reign. And then you move down to the next most important person. Well, who's the governor? Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea. And then you move down to the Tetrarchs. All right, who's in charge of Galilee and and these other places? So he lists off all those people. So we get Herod, uh, that's Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, um, and then, and then you have Lysanias, and then he goes to the, the priests, Annas and Caiaphas are the priests. What is he really saying here? There was a man whose name was John who preached in the wilderness, right? That's really what he's saying, but he's a historian, so he's like, all right, we don't have a, like, a agreed upon numbering dating system like we do today, so he's going to date it by everything that he can possibly hang it on. He talks more about women than the other Gospels as well. And I tend to think he had, he had uh, Mary as a source because you have a lot of stuff in Luke from Mary's point of view, especially early on, that you just don't have anywhere else. Uh, and uh, so I think that's, that's a strong possibility. Um, you know, of course, God could always just download stuff to any of these people while they're writing, right? But, uh, you know, we weren't really there. So we don't know exactly how the process went. We know that the end result is what God wanted it to be. But, um, you know, Luke seems to, to indicate here in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, that he did some work. He traveled around. He interviewed people. He, he tried to put it in an ordered account for this Theophilus guy. And uh, Luke also cares about social justice. The Holy Spirit is a major theme in Luke. We'll see that next time, too. And the inclusion of the Gentiles. All right, so when we talk about the Gospels, the four Gospels, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke we call the Synoptic Gospels. We have a special word for them. And that's because they all see from a similar perspective. 
Okay, They're all following a same kind of pattern. So that's why we call them the Synoptic Gospels. Um, Matthew and Luke quote Mark extensively, like word for word, exact Greek quotations. So it's likely that Mark was written first, and then Matthew and Luke were written a little later than that. And they had Mark, and they worked from Mark, but then they expanded upon it using whatever, whatever other sources they had. And the theory is that one of the sources they had had sayings in it, and they both had the same source. Because there's all kinds of material, like actual sayings of Christ, that are in Matthew and Luke that are not in Mark or John. Right? But it's, it's also clear that there's, like, Matthew is not like correcting Luke. I don't think Luke is correcting Matthew. I think they're independent from each other, uh, but they do have some common sources. And then they have unique material as well. And there's other, so that's just one theory that's like the most common theory, whether liberal or conservative, that's a pretty much accepted view that Mark is first, then Matthew and Luke you had a common source, and then John is on his, on his own. Whether he had them or not, he's doing his own thing. I, you know, we can't really say. So I thought Fee and Stewart, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart, uh, authors of How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, I thought they did well explaining this. This is how they put it. They said, the best explanation of all the data is that Mark wrote his gospel first, probably in part at least from his recollection of Peter's preaching and teaching. Luke and Matthew had access to Mark's gospel and independently used it as the basic source for their own. But they also had access to all kinds of other material about Jesus, some of which they had in common. This common material, however, is scarcely ever presented in the same order in the two Gospels, a fact suggesting that neither one had access to the other's writing. Finally, John wrote independently of the other three, and thus his Gospel has little material in common with them. This, we would note, is how the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the Gospels. With the Spirit's help, they creatively structured and rewrote the materials to meet the needs of their readers. Now, having said that, It is the case that there are plenty of events that happen in all four Gospels. For example, John the Baptist's ministry, uh, Jesus' teachings, uh, Jesus' baptism, Jesus' feeding of the 5,000, Jesus doing miracles. Like These things happen in all four Gospels. They're not all that different. It's just when you start to get to the really nitty-gritty that you start to see some of these other features. One theme that comes up a lot in the Gospels, especially the first three, the Synoptic Gospels, is the kingdom of God. Uh, Fee and Stewart say, the major hermeneutical difficulty lies with understanding the kingdom of God, a term that is absolutely crucial to the whole of Jesus' ministry. Why is it crucial to Jesus' ministry? Because everything he does is about the kingdom of God. Everything he says, maybe I'm overstating it slightly, I don't know. But, uh, you know, he, his, 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 uh, his Sermon on the Mount, eight times he mentions the kingdom of God. Why are you talking about the kingdom of God so much in a teaching on how to live? Well, because it affects how you live. Uh, his miracles he interprets as, as uh, anticipating the kingdom or evidence of the kingdom. Um, he's, he casts out a demon and he says, if I cast out this demon by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. you know, that's how he's interpreting his miracles. Uh, his gospel message is called the gospel of the kingdom. He goes around talking about the kingdom all the time. So the big question is, what is that? What is the kingdom of God? And he expects his hearers to know what he's talking about. He never has an aside and says, all right, now by the kingdom of God, this is what I mean. So there are different theories about what the kingdom of God is. Some people think it means heaven, Uh, especially if you're reading from the gospel of Matthew. He uses a phrase, kingdom of heaven, 32 times. The other 65 books of the Bible never use the phrase kingdom of heaven. It's literally just Matthew. And Matthew does also say kingdom of God five times, but he prefers to say kingdom of heaven. And so uh, some people are like, oh, well, the kingdom of God is just heaven. That's one theory. Another theory is that the kingdom of God is the community of disciples. It's the church. And there's lots of Christians today that will say that the kingdom is the church, and they'll use the language advancing the kingdom, by which they mean making more Christians or expanding the, the church. 
Uh, some other people will say the kingdom of God is a spiritual state of mind. It's God reigning in your heart. It's living in, in a certain way. That's the kingdom of God. But what I believe, and I think I can substantiate pretty easily from the Bible, is that the kingdom of God is the coming age when God rules our world through His King. That's what I think the kingdom of God is. It's, it's an age to come. Now, I want to be careful. Like I do believe that in a sense the kingdom is here and that we are the citizens of the kingdom, that the spirit of the kingdom is already available for us as Christians today, uh, that the lifestyle of the kingdom is here. You know? So I think there's a lot, of, a lot of kingdom that is here in that sense. But strictly speaking, God's not running our world. Sure doesn't look like that to me. And if he is, he's not doing a great job. And I'm uncomfortable saying that, right? So uh, it really seems uh, like God's not ruling our world. But what I think is really behind Jesus here is in his, his statement of the kingdom of God, and he, call, he calls himself the son of man a lot too. I think this is really pulling from Daniel, the prophet Daniel. And when we look at Daniel, we see a, a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of a statue of gold, a head of gold, and a chest of, what was the chest? Silver, and then the midsection of bronze, leg of iron, legs of iron. And then in the dream, the king sees a stone cut out without hands, and it smashes the statue on his feet, and it <laughs> blows it up into tiny pieces. And then that stone becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. And uh, the king calls in Daniel to give him the interpretation. And the interpretation is in Daniel 2.44. It says, In the days of those kings, each one of these different kinds of metal in the statue is a different kingdom. And then in the days of the last kings, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall this kingdom be left to another people. It shall crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So you can see here, where you would get kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, right? Like this, you have the God of heaven setting up a kingdom. So it's the kingdom of God or it's the kingdom of heaven. That's probably where this language came from specifically. The, the phrase kingdom of God, I, I don't think it shows up at all in the Old Testament if you typed it into a computer search, right? Um, another place that Jesus probably pulled from is Daniel 7, Daniel has another vision. Well, the, the first one was Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel has this vision in Daniel 7 where he sees the ocean and a lion comes out of the ocean and then a bear and then a leopard, then a terrifying beast. And each of these animals represents a kingdom. And then as he's looking, there's a judgment scene and he sees God in heaven sitting on his throne at court. And up to him comes a human being. And the human being is given the, the rulership of the earth. And that's Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And it's interesting, it says in Daniel 7, 13, as I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being. That's the translation I'm using, the NRSV. The actual phrase is son of man. And this, this is actually the phrase Jesus uses to refer to himself all the time. So that's why I think this, this particular prophecy was really, because son of man is not a very common phrase in the Old Testament. Ezekiel uses it a lot. In the book of Ezekiel, it just means a human being, just like a mortal, like not God, a, a, a person, a human. And, uh, but in Daniel 7.13, it's, it's like the, not just any person, but the person who receives authority to rule all peoples, nations, and languages forever. It says in Daniel 7, 14, To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that will never be destroyed. And then at the end of the vision, we get this statement. The kingship, this is Daniel 7, 27, The kingship and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the holy ones of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. The idea is that the Son of Man is going to receive a kingdom, and that He is going to then share that kingdom with the people of God, who are going to rule over it forever. 
This is a massive idea. It's found throughout the Bible, not just in the book of Daniel. But in the book of Daniel, we get this kingdom, specific kingdom language, as opposed to day of the Lord or in the last days or um, other places we'll talk about eternal life, especially the Gospel of John. These are just all different terminologies for this same idea. Okay, so why Son of Man? Why does he call himself that so much? Because it forces the hearer to decide. Son of Man could just mean a human being. It could just be like a humble referring term. I'm just a Son of Man. Or it could mean the Son of Man from Daniel 7.13, who's going to rule the kingdom. So it's, a, it's an excellent term that Jesus uses for himself. And then people have to decide, do I, be, do I believe that? Or, or is he just being a nice, humble guy? All right, a couple other points about reading the Gospels. Um, in the teachings of Jesus, he uses parables a lot. Parables, oh, if you want to learn more about the kingdom of God, I just wrote a book about it called Kingdom Journey, which uh, you can get now if you want. And it goes through the whole Bible and church history. So if you're, if you're interested in it, obviously, I think, I think it's pretty good. <laughs> All right, on to parables. A lot of what he says about the kingdom, he tells through parables, these little short fictional stories that make a point. The most important thing about parables is just to get the main point. Don't get lost in all the details. Sometimes parable, Jesus would tell a parable, and then he'll interpret it to his disciples and give you all the details. All right, great. If he gives it to you, take them. But if not, don't get lost in it. Now, there are some parables Jesus tells to hide the truth from people that don't really want to hear it. Other parables he tells to teach his disciples, like uh, the story about the, uh, the vine and the branches. In John 15, I don't know if that's technically a parable, but that's an illustration he uses to teach his disciples. There, there are no critics there, only people that really want to know. And then other parables are zingers, designed to confront his critics, designed to rebuke them. Now, the Gospels, they talk about the Word. And I want to mention this a little bit that the Word of God, especially in the Gospels, typically refers to a message, not the Bible. Like the kingdom of God, the word Word is commonly misunderstood. The Bible does not typically call itself the Word. You want to call it the Word? It's a free country. Call it the Word. But the Bible typically calls itself the Scriptures or the writings, or the prophets, or the Holy Spirit spoke through so-and-so. You know, it, doesn't, it just doesn't use the word word for that. And this can confuse you if you think that when it refers to the word, it means the Bible in general, as opposed to a spoken message that God has given to Jesus. Jesus' message was to repent. Jesus' message to people was to repent in light of the coming of the kingdom. It wasn't to believe in the Bible. The Jews already believed in the Bible. They were already pro-Bible. It was to believe in this kingdom and to repent in light of it. It says, I want to show you this, Mark 4.13. So this is the parable of the sower and the seed. And he said to them, do you, do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Then in Luke 8, 11 and 12, we read the same, it's from the same saying of Christ, but it's from a different gospel, so it's slightly different. Luke 8, 11 says, Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The ones on the, on the path are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Then we get Matthew, which is even shorter. Ironically, Mark's the longest one here. <laughs> Mark, uh, Matthew 13, 19 says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. So we see here in Mark, they sow... Well, we've got to change... I'm going to change colors here. 
All right, so he sows the word. And then in Luke, it's the word of God. Talking about something totally different, right? No. No. No, oh, it's the same thing. It's just, the, it calls it the Word in Mark, but in Luke it calls it the Word of God. The same thing, right? And then over here, it's the Word of the Kingdom. So it's all the same thing. And this is how you can use the Gospels to help you understand when you have something that is repeated, you can see it from different angles. Think about different dimensions. You have uh, length and width and height, right? And, and you can see something in more dimensions. We have four Gospels. It's a blessing. <laughs> and it can help us to figure things out. So just a word about the Word is that the, the word Word typically refers to the spoken message, in this case, the Word or message of the kingdom. That's what Jesus is planting in people's hearts. Actually, He's just casting it around, like just drop it everywhere. But uh, if it takes root in your heart, it results in salvation. All right, on to our last point, which is about application. When reading the Gospels, it's important for you to discern what applies to the specific situation that Jesus was in and what applies to you today. Because not everything does. I'll give you an example. Matthew chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus says, "...take no gold or silver or copper in your belts." No bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. Which one among us, who, lives this scripture out in your life? Have you cast away your wallet? Have you liquidated your bank accounts? Do you only have one pair of shoes? Do you go to towns? and inquire who might be worthy to host you so you can mooch on them indefinitely. <laughs> you, don't, you don't go to a town and ask, hey, can I mooch off of you? For, I mean, you wouldn't say it that way. You say, well, are you worthy for me to mooch off of you? No, this is something that applied to that specific situation. Jesus was sending out these 12 disciples they were not going for years. They are going for a limited amount of time. Jesus was traveling. Jesus was going to go to the towns. And they were going first to prepare the way for him. And that was in a particular culture where it was understood that you would take care of somebody with hospitality, especially if they were preparing for an important spiritual rabbi or leader to come. Or what about Luke 6.27? But I say to you who are listening, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Was this just for the people that were there at that time, or is this for all Christians? Well, I think it's for all Christians, even though this is a hard saying, an extremely difficult teaching to live out. Probably the most difficult, that's why I picked it, you know. It illustrates this so well. But how do we know this is for all Christians for all times? Well, it's repeated in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. It's repeated in Romans 12, 17 to 21. It's repeated in 1 Peter 3, 9 through 11. And then it's lived out not only by Jesus, who did this in his ministry, but also Stephen in Acts chapter 7 did this. He's being stoned, and he says, lay not the sin to their charge. He loves his enemies even to the very end. It's not just one saying of Jesus. So that can give you a clue as to what is applicable to Christians for all time and what is only for that specific situation, if it's repeated. Another, as I was making a mention, is if it's exemplified by Jesus. If it's something that Jesus carried out in his life, that would be another indication that this is not just a specific situation, but something that is applicable for everyone. So I think you should read the Gospels frequently. I think they're really important. Um, and especially, I used, to, I used to think what really matters is, is just Matthew and Luke. Because Matthew and Luke gives you like the most sayings of Jesus, like the actual teachings, like do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that. But I, I don't think it's so simple. I think, I think Mark's at, Mark has, has kind of grown on me, and I've, I've, I've come to love Mark a lot too. Um, and, uh, and John, John is magnificent. If you need something to think about, read the Gospel of John. See if you can figure it out. 
You know, like there are profound truths there, deep, deep waters in the Gospel of John, right? And so I think all four Gospels are God designed for the church for all time, for us to, to, to be fed by. I think you need to have a steady diet of the Gospels. <laughs> I told you before that Billy Graham read a proverb a day and five Psalms a day. I don't know how much he read the Gospels, but I'm recommending to you that if you have to choose between reading Psalms or Proverbs or the Gospels, Gospels are even more important because these are the words of Jesus. These are the deeds of Jesus. These, this is the meaning of what Jesus accomplished and how he carried himself. So eat them like food. Eat your Gospels. I actually had, originally had a picture of a lady eating a salad and I was thinking, well, some people don't like salad. So I don't want to associate the Gospels with just like vegetables. I think they're, I think they're sweet to the, to the taste as well. I don't think they're just like eating your vegetables. So this guy looks like he's not holding back. I think he'd be a good, he's a good example. All right, let's review. The New Testament begins with four evangelistic biographies of Jesus called Gospels. Mark is the shortest Gospel. It's action-packed narrative probably derived from Peter's recollections as well as God's direction via his, via his Spirit. John is the most theologically developed, and it contains monologues where Jesus talks about himself and his relationship to his Father. Matthew showcases Jesus as a rabbi who teaches his followers how to live in light of the kingdom of God. Luke was a careful historian who made an effort to present a well-ordered account of the life of Christ to a noble Roman audience. The kingdom of God is the core of Jesus' message and ministry. It refers to a coming age, not a place, but an age, when God sets everything wrong with the world right. Jesus' favorite self-title was Son of Man, which could either mean a human being or the ruler of the coming kingdom. Parables are short fictional stories told to make a point. In the Gospels, the Word refers to the message Jesus preached about the kingdom of God, not the Bible in general. Although it's hard to be sure, most think Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source as well as another saying source. Yeah, that's kind of speculative, but it's, it's commonly, commonly believed by the people that study it in, in detail, so I figured I'd let you know about it. And then last up, in order to discern what sayings of Jesus apply to you, consider the circumstances in which they were given. Whether other parts of the New Testament repeat the statement and what Jesus' example can tell you. Now, next time, we're going to look at the New Testament's other historical book. Just like the Old Testament begins with historical narratives, the New Testament begins with historical narratives. And just like the Old Testament, the first section of the historical narratives are special. We call it the Torah. So in the New Testament, the first section of the historical narratives are special. We call them the Gospels. Uh, but instead of like having all these books of kings, we just have the book of Acts. Uh, so we're going to turn to that next time as we continue in our class. Read the Bible for yourself.